Prime Minister Puna, uh, we have one question for you from this old gentleman, uh, Vaka crew member. First of all, I, I just want to say um, thank you very much uh, as a leader of the Pacific to uh, take time to uh, off your busy schedule and and come together uh, with us. You know, in our families, we always look up to our leaders. The question is this, in your uh, talk up there, you mentioned something about uh, Polynesian promise. Can you uh, please the Puna, elaborate a little bit more? But because to me, this is very, very important. About the Polynesian promise. What is it? Really? Thank you. I knew I was sticking my neck out a little bit this morning. But uh, no, I think it's important that we uh, we start with the building blocks. And within the Forum region, we have the Polynesian Leaders Group. This is the Cook Islands, Tahiti, French Polynesia. Niue, Tonga, Samoa, Tokelo, and, and uh, Tuvalu. So, you know, together we cover a pretty uh, large area of the Pacific. And although we haven't had an opportunity to talk about it yet, um, we have an opportunity later on uh, this month, in the next couple of weeks, to get together both in New Caledonia and in Fiji, when we will sit down and I will try and persuade my fellow leaders to come along with the idea of setting aside uh, protected areas within the country. Right. Uh, David, we have, uh, before your question, um, uh, His Excellency uh, Mendesau needs to go. Uh, he's got a 12 o'clock commitment, and so if I can give him the floor for one last word before you uh, leave. Thank you. And I just want to uh, to share this with us because there is a, a wisdom in, in the setting aside of marine protected areas. Most people think that we're just setting aside X amount of square miles for the protection of those resources within that MPA. When that is not the scientific truth. The scientific truth has been proven, has proven through Palau research, through the University of Guam research, the University of Hawaii research and throughout the region that setting aside if you declare the whole reef open for fishing the population of that whole reef will dramatically be depleted a lot faster then if you set aside just one third of that reef and make it a no-take zone then the two-thirds you may think is smaller but actually you end up harvesting more fish and more marine resources from that two-third over the same period of time than if you did if you just opened the whole area. That is the wisdom of the marine protected area uh, reservation. So imagine this on the whole Pacific scale. The whole Pacific Ocean also needs one-third at least of a marine protected no-take zone in order for the tuna population, in order for the pelagic fish population, turtles, whatever you have it, to feel that there is a rest area, to feel that there is a nurturing area, to feel like there is a, a heaven for them to to breathe and to recover. Like a, if you're driving on a long distance, you need that rest area to get back your strength. So the whole Pacific wide and the future of the Pacific can be best better protected if each of the island nations in the Pacific have an MPA. Not for that one third uh, marine, but for the sake of the two third that needs to be harvested because we need fish, we need resources, but there must be a safe haven. And that's the wisdom of the MPA. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency uh, uh, um, Sir, in all Pacific fashion, we have to send you out in style. So, if we can, 
send you Arkin's tag. <laughs> Just uh, the last point I think is very important. Often in our region, the fisheries debate is framed around marine protected areas, anti-development, anti-fishing. In fact, it's promotion of fishing. So I think arguments like those, arguments about the value of marine protected areas for ecotourism need to be made more forcefully, exactly as we've just heard. But President Tong, if I could ask uh, a question. I get the feeling now about one year similar to Copenhagen when we were going for the climate uh, negotiation, big expectations. Now we're moving up in a year's time to Paris, similar expectations building. How can we learn from the past experience? How can we build on the initiative we heard yesterday from the US uh, and China? How can we position the Pacific to get a better outcome of the climate convention meeting in Paris when we are looking for a legally binding agreement? Right? really value your advice and wisdom on that. Thank you, David. I, I've been at this for quite a long time. I, I was actually uh, perhaps one of the few le uh, leaders from a developing country. I was the only one from the Pacific uh, because of the noises that I've been making. Uh, in the close dinner involving about 20 leaders, that there was Obama, there was uh, the former uh, president of China, and uh, a whole lot of leaders. And uh, I was listening to these leaders talking about the economic growth, how uh, the action on climate change would uh, impact the economic growth. And I, I couldn't help it, I almost burst out, but you have to take your turn to, to speak. So I, I spoke with a note to the, 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 the DSG, said I, I'd like to speak. And so I, my comment was very really brief. I said, yes, I can understand where you're coming from about uh, your economies, but Please also understand that I'm coming from a different angle. I'm talking about the survival of our people, and please, you know, this is not uh, insignificant, it's important. And so I was listening to people like Sarkozy being very positive, and I, so that was um, in September. Um, Copenhagen was about a couple of months later. And um, leading up to Copenhagen, I was quite optimistic. I thought there would be an agreement, but uh, when we got to Copenhagen, it was miserably cold. And then uh, uh, Obama came, and uh, he, we, of course, the news travels fast. We knew that he was not going to make a commitment. And uh, by, but before, during the meeting in, 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 uh, in New York in September, I approached the chairman, the upcoming chairman of the, uh, the conference, the Prime Minister of uh, Denmark. I said, uh, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, we won't get very far if we're going to just go there and deliver our statements. But is, is there a way that you can get interaction between leaders uh, so that we can say what we need to be said, what we need to say? But th that didn't happen. Until the last minute, and I, I, if those who were at Copenhagen will recall that, there were meetings in the middle of the morning. I gave up. I said, no, we won't do anything. And so Copenhagen was a great disappointment. Nevertheless, there was progress. There was a, a Copenhagen uh, Accord. Ever since, I, I almost gave up. But I remember going back that evening, and uh, there was people like yourselves from the civil society who would come and support us. And so I hosted them the dinner, and I, I thanked them for their support. And uh, in the process, I, I, tears were coming down my eyes, and I, maybe it was the cold, I was miserable. <laughs> I, I was very, very, very disappointed. And I came back away, virtually licking my wounds, but I, I couldn't give up. And so I've been keeping at it, and keeping at it. But I can tell you that what is happening now is very, very different from what was happening then. It's always been my contention that if the United States could come on board, then the rest would follow. And I kept telling the United States this over the years. But now that both the United States and China are on, are on, are on board, the rest will actually follow. I'm very, very, very confident that the rest will follow. And 
this is the kind of leadership that I've been calling for, global leadership on climate change. And uh, we've been trying to lead, but they won't listen to us. To us. But they will listen to the United States, they will listen to China. We will have a meeting with the Prime Minister of uh, India in Fiji in, in, uh, next week. We hope that the message of what's happened will communicate. We hope the message of what's happened will communicate to the leadership in Australia and to the rest of the, uh, the, the leaders in the international community. So I am very, very confident that we will have an agreement uh, coming out of Paris, I believe. But again, I want to make that point again. It's not over for us. Those of us on the front line will continue to go down. So we need the global, the international community to continue to address what is to happen. What are they going to do about us, if anything? But the point is, also, we've got to do as much ourselves. And this is uh, why I, in all of what's been going on, I've always believed that uh, we made, we made mistakes in the past, and our biggest mistake was not to have come in much earlier on the climate issue. We should have come in much, much earlier together. We should have been solid. And I think we always as, uh, we've always regarded ourselves as small, and therefore have a perception that we cannot influence the, the outcome of international events. And I think what's happened really demonstrated that we have no choice. We've got to be there. And we can make a difference. And I think the reality is on the climate change issue, on the oceans issue, we in the Pacific are taking leadership, have been taking leadership. Thank you. Yes, uh, Prime Minister and President, I recall at the forum meeting in Marshall Islands last year, President Loeck said, we're not just standing on the shore waving our hands. In fact, we've seen from your commitments global leadership. We've seen renewable energy targets being achieved at a rate far higher than anywhere else in the region. So that leadership is fundamental, but others must join. But Prime Minister, any comments on this? Thank you. In the aftermath of Copenhagen, uh, there was a real danger that we would give up, uh, as uh, President Tong has said. And yet, we took uh, things into consideration and we thought, what the hell? If the rest of the world not going to do anything, we will. But but that's what we thought, and uh, it was during that time that we came up with some far-reaching policy commitments. You know, we made a commitment to convert our energy use from diesel to renewable, 50% conversion by next year and 100 by 2020. You know, people thought I was crazy. And yet I will have the last laugh because by May next year, we would have 50% uh, conversion. And immediately we will start on the remaining 50%. So where there's a will, there's a way. I firmly believe that. But as I said, um, you know, uh, when we put these commitments into place, we weren't thinking about the rest of the world, not after Copenhagen. We thought we'd do it for our own sake, because we know it's the right thing to do, and it makes us feel good doing it. And if the rest of the world catches up with us, well and good. If not, then we'll fade away happy knowing that we did our part. One of the important lessons I've learned from uh, our communities up in the north that are not currently part of the marine park is that there is a very, very strong consciousness about the environment. Our people want to do the right thing. And they came back with clear recommendations. One, they want to be included into the marine park. Two, they want exclusion zones around their islands so that they can be guaranteed of sustainable supply of fish for their nourishment and we have accepted that so not only will they come on board as part of the park but there will also be exclusion zones around each island as president uh, ribbing so said it is to provide a haven for the fishes so that they can come and rest and breed 
and recover.